Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is David Hertzberg. I'm one of the editors of the Social History of Alcohol and Drugs, which is the Journal of the Alcohol and Drugs History Society, which is also the sponsor of this blog, uh, the Points blog of the Alcohol and Drug History Society. And as you know, Points regularly interviews the authors of exciting new works in the field. And we're trying a new thing this time. We're having a video interview with one of those authors. So I want to Welcome all of you to this uh, new experiment for the Points blog, and I want to give a special welcome to our guest of honor, Dr. Yan Liu. He's an assistant professor of history at the University of Buffalo, uh, which is part of the SUNY system, and we're here to talk about his new book, Healing with Poisons, Potent Medicines in Medieval China. It's a great book, and I'm really looking forward to this very brief conversation. We will uh, get you in and out quickly. So thank you for being here, Dr. Liu. And, uh, can you start by setting the stage for readers who may not be familiar with uh, Chinese history? Like what time period does your book examine? What was going on in China then? And why is that period important for understanding traditional Chinese medicine? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Christopher, for this great opportunity. I'd love to share uh, uh, my uh, thinking and uh, research of my book with this uh, uh, the audience. And so speaking of the time period of my book, uh, it's actually quite uh, a long time ago. I used medieval uh, China in the title, uh, which is an expedient term referring to uh, the first millennium of the common era, roughly from the third century to the eighth century, about 600 years of history. Uh, I consider this period of time in the long history of Chinese medicine a crucial period of time for the evolution and development of Chinese pharmacology, mm -hmm. uh, not just because of the bounded use of poisons, which is the topic of this book, but also we find the first state-sponsored pharmacopoeia in the seventh century. We find the inclusion of medical cases in the form of books uh, during this period of time. We also find the practice of alchemy, which involved the use of mineral drugs, uh, a very uh, 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 important tradition uh, during this period of time as well. So that's why I uh, decided to focus on uh, this period of time and roughly Within the 600 years of history, it can be divided into two parts. The first 300 years uh, is so-called era of division. At that time, there are two confronting regimes in the South and North. And I focus on the Southern regimes because of the abundance of uh, abundant production of pharmacological literature, uh, primarily produced by the capable individuals and aristocratic families. And in the second half of this period, uh, it's very interesting. We find an interesting transition from this time of division to a unified country by two dynasties, Sui and Tang, where we find the state played a very important role in uh, establishing new in medical institutions and producing new pharmacological writings. Uh, and that I think uh, is very important for me to uh, uh, explore in the context of the evolution of Chinese pharmacology. So uh, what are some of the most important big picture things that readers will learn about the role of poisons in Chinese medicine at this formative time uh, when reading your book? Sure. So as you can see from the title of my book, Heating with Poisons, which already sort of delivered the essential argument that which is there's a strong tradition of using poisons in the Chinese pharmacological tradition. Uh, and there's no categorical distinction between poisons and medicines as we see it today. That's actually the, the most important message I want to share with my readers. Uh, there's an there's important word, a word in, in, in Chinese uh, text called du. Uh, this, this word today, which means poison, uh, very similar to you know, English word. But in the time uh, I studied, uh, it actually meant potency, which mm -hmm carry this paradoxical meaning of both as a healing agent, but also as, as a harming agent. So doctors in China in the past, actually, they were fully aware of this paradoxical nature of this, this meaning of potency and do. So in, instead of avoiding these uh, powerful substances altogether, actually they developed a variety of methods to try to transform these poisons into therapeutic agents. For example, by using the doses control, by combining poisons with uh, less powerful ingredients, or by processing methods such as heating or soaking to try to 
mitigate the power of these substances, but still preserve its therapeutic uh, potency. So that's actually really the key. And I also uh, uh, identify that there's other ways of thinking about poison medicines at the time, not just the technological intervention, but also how these powerful substances interact with individual body and the particular sensations upon uh, a subject to different interpretations at the time could define whether this substance is a poison or a medicine. And moreover, there's also in the broader context of the political and social values assigned to these substances depends on the political, political and social conditions that determine what is a poison or medicine. So the, the take home message here is, is actually, there's no material essence that defined whether substance is, is a poison or medicine in medieval China. Context mattered. The context involves technological in, uh, engagement, involves body sensations, involves the social political conditions. And that's really something I want to share with my readers. So I'm, I'm taken by this use of this word potency which is a way to try to bring in both poison and medicine. And, and this signals it the way that your book challenges some of these most basic American and European categories for thinking about drugs. So the distinction between medicines and poisons or between therapeutic effects and so-called side effects uh, and the distinction between say healing and spiritual rejuvenation. What, what kinds of broader lessons can we learn about this, uh, this level of pharmacology, the how to think about drugs, how to categorize drugs from this era of Chinese medicine? Thank you for this uh, great question. And so uh, surely, you know, one part of the goal of this book is try to, you know, sort of review this almost forgotten tradition of the use of poisons, strength medicine, but also I very much want to relate this story to our uh, contemporary you know, pharmaceutical practice and bring the conversation to this broader audience, not just those who are interested in Chinese medicine, but in medicine, smart pharmacy in general. Um, and so my, uh, my message here is that I really try to highlight the paradoxical, paradoxical nature of drug therapy, not just Chinese medicine, but you know, Western biomedicine as well. I mean, in a sense, we compare to comparing the, you know, the use of powerful substances in Chinese pharmacy, like aconite, arsenic, or mercury, to, for example, you know, chemotherapy today, that we find that in both cases, we use powerful poisons actually to cure diseases. And conversely, sometimes the seemingly benign substances, if we use incorrectly or wrongly, uh, it could uh, cause serious problems and uh, Dr. Hersby, your own book actually speak volume to that problem in uh, 20th century mark. So I find this is quite interesting. I want to uh, share with my audience uh, two uh, important information here. One is that uh, medicine, uh, medicines are relational. Actually, we should go beyond the contemporary, in the particular in the pharmace uh, pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals, you know, when you think about drugs, we think about active ingredient. Right, so uh, there's it's an essence of a drug defined what it is. I want to invite my readers and my audience to go beyond uh, the, the concept of active ingredient to think about medicines as a relation of substances. Whether something is poison or medicine, it depends on how it interacts with our body, how uh, uh, what kind of techniques involved, what kind of social values it, uh, uh, it, uh, it, 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 it obtains. So all these matters, right? It's not a fixed. Uh, unchanging essence that defines what it is. It is relational. And secondly, as you pointed out, that the side effect is something quite interesting because oftentimes well, my study of medicine in medieval China really conflated the side effect and therapeutic effects and making me think about healing actually is a perceptual and dynamic process. And sometimes the side effects as we see it was was kind of therapeutic effects for the people who experienced this kind of powerful medicines in the past. As long as it's temporary, as long as it can manageable, they consider as the purification of the body and elimination of the illnesses. So we need to think about healing as a, as a process that oftentimes the, the ingestion of the drugs is just a starting point. And there's a following steps we need to, uh, we need to do, we need to maneuver to make sure 
uh, that you know the safety of the drug and make the drug uh, you know manifest its full efficacy. So that's something I want to share with my my, my readers. You point out that uh, there's um, that Chinese medicine can develop a popular reputation in the U.S. In, in particular, in the West, as being mild and benign, as in not involving poisonous medicines like chemotherapy. And I wonder uh, if you think that there are costs to this kind of misunderstanding of Chinese medicine that need to be corrected uh, by work like your book. Yeah, yeah, great question. So actually, that's the starting point of my uh, uh, writing this book, this, this starting from a contemporary moment, was, uh, what I see as the misconceived misconce- uh, dichotomy between Chinese and Western biomedicine. Right, as you rightly pointed out. I think there's problem of this dichotomy. I think my book really kind of elaborate that uh, by, 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 by giving this historical story of poisons. Uh, on one hand, this is historically problematic because when we think about Chinese medicine, I mean, my book hopefully abundantly show that the poison mattered quite a lot in Chinese pharmacy, both in the past and in, in the contemporary setting. Right, so it's not black and white in Chinese medicine versus black and Western medicine. It's more of a, this kind of projection is more of an idealized, romanticized version of Chinese medicine that does not, does not do justice to the actual history, a complex history, both historical and, and, and contemporary practice of medicine in China. So that's one thing I, 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 I want to give the more, in a sense, more authentic picture of Chinese mm. medicine. To, to, to my audience. And also from the practitioner's pr- uh, perspective, I think um, my story also gives some uh, lessons to, because trans medicine, just like any medicine, any culture system, it could uh, uh, cause serious problems, even if it's labeled as natural or benign, if it's mishandled, misused. And that I give lots of examples uh, in history and, and we also have contemporary examples, as, as, I, as I discussed in the conclusion part of my book. So this is something, you know, I think it's quite serious. We cannot just use this kind of misconceived economy as a way, uh, as a guidance to use trans medicine and which will, will have practical issues, right? So I think both historically and practically, I think this, this economy need to be debunked. This means needs to be debunked and we need to have a more fully a full complex picture of Chinese medicine, more dynamics. There's a lot of debates, controversies, a lot of history. And so, of course, it's different from Western medicine on many you know, levels, but uh, this kind of black and white uh, mm-hmm. contrast is, is, is of no use, no help actually for us to have a deeper understanding of Chinese medicine. Okay, so this is uh, an alcohol and drug history blog. So of course, I've got to ask you about psychoactive effects. Uh, were psycho effect, psychoactive effects among those uh, potent capabilities prized by Chinese healers during this time? How did they fit into the era's categorizations, fit into this story of poisons? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I did find some of the psychoactive drugs uh, uh, in my research, uh, such as hembane, such as cannabis. Interestingly, cannabis uh, was included in the food category of the pharmacy, uh, which means it can be consumed regularly, regularly with small dose, but if, if consumed um, uh, in excess, uh, I mean, their language is that the people who see demons then work crazily, work crazily, which indicates this kind of disturbance of the mind. So, and I do find the majority of the psychoactive drugs at the time was defined as uh, poisonous or do possessing or potent. And I uh, devoted some of my energies to this one particular compound drug called five stone powder, which involved arsenic in it. And uh, so it, this, this drug could not just strengthen the body, but also illuminate the mind according to the people at the time. So that's why it became very popular among official scholars uh, because they believe this drug can enhance their literary performance. And, but this drug is also very powerful uh, because it, 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 it contains arsenic. So uh, at that time, there's a lot of debates among physicians, among scholars, in terms of not, not the, the, the center of the debate is not about whether this drug should be banned whatsoever, right? So it's more about the proper administration of the drug. What is the right way to 
release the tremendous heat produced by the mineral after the patient ingests the drug. And that's really the center of the discussion. And that's really fascinating me because again, this, uh, this echoes what I said earlier that the context really matter. In this case, how to properly uh, consume the drug becomes the center of the, of the discussion. We've talked about big, important ideas and important interventions. Uh, is there uh, some part of the book that maybe could be a little smaller that, uh, that just really uh, especially fascinated you and that you drew you in and that even though it may not be on the top line or on the back cover, you're kind of hoping that readers don't miss when they, when they go through the book? Yeah. Uh, so one part of book I really enjoy writing, I, I hope you know you enjoy reading, uh, is, is this is in chapter three. So there's a very famous saying uh, in Chinese, Chinese medicine, Chinese culture called uh, idu gongdu, which means using poison to attack poison. Basically, this speaks to the rationale of using poisons in Chinese medicine. Only, you know, w- w- people use poison to treat or hard to treat illnesses. Right, so and in that chapter, I dis- I connect the rationale of using poison treatment medicine to etiology, the cause of illness, and I find that oftentimes uh, illnesses were imagined as demonic entities or vermin at the time, and the powerful substances like these poisons can strike them and kill them or uh, expel them out of the body. That is the underlying rationale of using these powerful substances, what I call ontological imagination of the illness. Uh, interestingly, uh, this is not just limited to the medical realm. Actually, there is a very interesting political implication of this. That is the state, this is in the seventh century, the state actually implemented stringent policies, just like doctor used powerful poisons to eliminate dangerous people, in this case is witchcraft practitioners in the society, try to get rid of them to cure a political and social body. And I find this parallel is very interesting. So that chapter or part of the chapter really ties etiology, poison, demonology, politics and gender together because the people often, uh, women practitioners of witchcraft practice. So it's really, I hope something uh, you, 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 you enjoy reading. Uh, let's see, we're, we're at our last question, which is that obviously you worked a long and hard on this book and you turned over a lot of stones, more than five, I'd say. Um, but <laughs> the nice. project leaves some stones unturned. And what stones are you most curious to see turned over sometime soon? What are you curious about that you didn't manage to get to in this book? Yeah, so there, there, there are a few stones I'd like to turn over soon. Uh, one is just from a comparative perspective, I'm fascinated uh, in, in con- comparing Chinese medicine, a particular use of poisons and, and uh, European uh, tradition of using poisons. And we know there is uh, our English word pharmacy, pharmacology derived from the Greek word pharmacon. And so I only discussed very briefly uh, of the comparison between do in Chinese context and pharmacon in European context in introduction. And I'd like to do some deeper uh, uh, comparison between these two important like foundational concept in training and, and, and Western pharmacology. And so there's certainly similarities between the two uh, in terms of paradoxical meaning of these terms uh, between poison and medicine, but also uh, I try to find some interesting di- uh, divergence. That is uh, my preliminary research says, you know, the Chinese medicine throughout its, throughout the imperial time, we, I don't really see a very uh, 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 pronounced the separation between poison and medicines. But in the European tradition, this is according to the Frederick Gibbs book, that you know there is a separation of the two, at least from as early as, early as 13th century. So I want to just delve deeper into this comparative project. Um, and relatedly, uh, within the Chinese tradition, I find that do this word do actually today means it, it carries a very negative sense, just like poison in English. It was not always the case, right? In the past, it was more you know, ambiguous and paradoxical. So I'm, I'm curious, when did this happen? When did this change of the word do, you know, happened? And my s- suspected period of time is in late imperial China uh, around 16th, 17th century, when this term became to associate with more negative meaning, whether it's because of the external influence from, from European medicine or because of internal dynamic. 
Uh, I don't know, but that's an interesting problem uh, to yeah. answer. Now, those sound like fascinating questions, and uh, I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing more of your work and answering them. Uh, for now, uh, let me thank you again, Dr. Liu, for showing up and remind everyone that the book we're discussing is Healing with Poisons, Potent Medicines in Medieval China, chock full of fascinating stories, and really, as you have just heard, really interesting an analysis and thoughts about the basic categories and processes by which we categorize medicines, categorize therapies. It's well worth your time. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Hersberg. Uh, I greatly enjoyed the conversation.